plan. So, so off the ice there. Any uh, any further updates on your on ice experience of late? Anything sticking out? Of Anything late? top of mind? Communication's a big thing. It's a big thing. It's always a big thing. Kids don't like to talk so much anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm forcing it out of them. I'm beating it out of them. That now these are younger. Not yeah, they're younger, but not like three. They're younger, <laughs> meaning what, what would they be? With the younger group? group. The younger five, group would five be five to eight. So that's twenty. Be twenty twelve. So ten to 12, 10 to twelve years old. No, be twelve to see my math. Twelve to fourteen. Yeah, twelve to fourteen years old, and then the group uh, uh, higher. Same thing. Mm-hmm. They don't like to communicate, and and the other piece is moving their feet, like in little circumstances. So I'm just harping on that. So it's just things that show up every day. It's funny you say that. Telegraphing shots, telegraphing passes, not moving feet, not communicating. Yes, I had the, literally those same things at practice yesterday. I saw I was on fire yesterday. I was ripping some of the kids yesterday. Yeah. Um, you like it? It's just frustrating. It's just frustrating, like little things that, and I remember the being on the player side. So I always cut them the slack. Like I always, whenever I'm explaining stuff, I always say, guys, like I remember as the player, like sitting and listening to my coach saying, move your feet, saying, stay on the D side, staying, saying all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah. But honestly, guys, we are not good at it. <laughs> like we need to be better at it, you know. So it's it's frustrating. But I do remember being on their side of it. So I try to remember what that's like, so that I'm not just wanting to rip my own head off. Because what a piece of patience you need in some of these situations. Yeah, as yeah. A coach. Well, man, you, that's when you snap it. Yeah, get it. It's it's hard. I've I've been so much calmer now than I used to be. Yeah, yeah. I've learned some patience. Oh, and I love working with the junior team. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's been very good. I like it a lot. They're great too, man. Yeah. They're they're a good team. Yeah, they're a good team. Um, but I was talking with our guys at practice yesterday about the same things, the communication stuff. Just like we're doing, like we were doing a two on two down low drill, and I'm working on all the things you just said: moving your feet, you can't get beat back to the net, staying on D side, good sticks, like all the little things that in the games that we had on the weekend were not good. And I'm like, it's quiet. I'm like no one's saying anything. I can hear all I hear is the skates. You know, and I'm like, guys, like, how do you know where your buddy is? Like, how do you know where to put the puck? How do you know who's taking who? You don't. And this is why we get lost in the D zone. You know, you lose your coverage. You lose your guy. Nobody knows who to take that. Who's going to take that guy in those types of situations. So you have to talk. Yeah. So we're not a habit. It's such a, it's such a habit right? that has to be built into players. Yeah. Well, so I, what I always like to say good things too, right? So the kids, the younger group, I was saying that the, like explain it to them like and it's just i know some people say what do you mean by that but when you communicate when you're when you're um saying hey hey like here not whatever you say to get a puck or to communicate on the ice it adds an element of energy like it might be a stick tap with a hey 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 and doing that every rep pretty much you should be doing it every rep and if you're not it's like real quiet it's really funny when you start doing that the energy goes up immediately and this drill becomes better or the whatever it is you're doing becomes a little bit more intense and they see it right so it was that getting them to move their feet so i went over a couple of those things and it was like it changed but it's not a habit for them yet and i'll make one more comment in a second it's not a habit for them yet but then i also pointed out what they did well so when i was pointing out the drills i was explaining them on angles you come into passes you know take this angle, that angle, because, because, and they did it on a pretty consistent basic, basic assists, which kept, uh, kept our, I, cause I was working on pa- just a lot of passing while you're moving and stuff like that in different situations. But the one observation I have, and I was still, you know, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to say it right now because, because we are involved in an academy and, and these, these players are on the ice a lot. I think they're on the ice too much. I, I I'm a firm, firm believer there in that because I, I said to them that exactly that I said I I don't want to take away the you know the opportunities that you have of being on the ice a lot because you you're here at the academy you're here at you've got your own team plus games plus practices so I'm gonna say I'm gonna assume it's at least seven times a week they're on the ice but I'm gonna say it's actually more yeah because all of them do the extra skills coach and yeah. all this stuff too right and the body language not that it's negative but the body language the excitement to be on the ice 
no matter what you do, is really, really hard to get them fired up. So I think that that's one thing that they're on the ice too much with too much instruction. I think they're not doing it enough on their own, which would be fine if they did. And I think the duration of the skates are too long. I Especially if you're doing, if you're on the ice that often during a week or during the year, I don't think you need more than 50 minutes. You could go 40 nice and quick and hard and you're good. I think the only exception to that would be if you're doing games. Because adding games at the end, kids can do that and be engaged for yeah, longer. Yeah, but I don't find the intensity still there. Well, I, but I see, I think there's there's a different problem. I think the intensity is just not there in general. But, like, I think they're just not, like, kids are just not that intense. And I don't know. I guess from my perspective, it's it's that I've worked with older guys for so long. That for, to be a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, it could be a... a a function of skill, talent, uh, interest. They're not quite weeded out yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. That yeah. could be what it is. Yeah, it could be that. I, I But I, I just looked when I was a kid, it was just I loved being on the ice so much. But I was on the ice in practice whenever I could, but I did my own thing on the side. And I could be I could be lying to myself. I could have not liked hockey that much, but I don't remember it that way. Well, and I think even for for these kids that we're not working with, they didn't come up in our system where that's the expectation. So I remember when you were doing this several years ago with a similar group, even younger, these guys are like talking on it intense. And I think a a lot of that is not being taught intensity either. So that's why I think if the the ice time, yeah, you don't want to be too long, but adding games where the only focus is just, yeah, intensity on the game, then I think you can pull a little bit more out of it. But I I get what you mean, like the... But even that's got to be short because after they get about... Three, four, three to five shifts. You can just start yeah. seeing it going. Okay, well, I'm not back checking and stuff. That's exactly what I was going to say. We finished our practice yesterday with uh, three on three down low because the whole practice was kind of like we were working on keeping good gaps and battles and not losing your man and all that stuff. So we were going to do face offs at the end, but instead I was like, I did, let's keep the battle going kind of thing. So we did three on threes and I played. And I had a couple of the guys come up because they've never, they don't, they don't know that I played and they've never seen me play. You know, so I go and I play and I'm not horrible. So I, they, they, a couple of them come up to me. They're like, man, you're actually, you're really quick. Like you're, you get on it quick, you can shoot whatever. And I don't think it was that so much as it was the voice and the, just the intensity of movement that I had, because I'm not that quick and there's not that much space to be super quick. So for me in that three on three situation, but the whole time I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is my guy. Right. Or when there's a loose puck, I, I move with some urgency. So I don't think it's that my, my speed is actually that high. I think it's just the intensity pieces there. So when you watch me, there's energy that's brought to the situation, which is what I was, was saying to you. And that's something I've learned from playing at a high level. It's like, you have to bring that, you know, and they don't have it. So they're watching and I'm not doing it to make a point or on purpose. No, that's your habits. Playing, it's just the habits are still there. Yeah, I can't do you know? it without it. Yeah. So and as it's soon as exactly. I jump in a drill or play in a game, that's like, now it's like the, it's the on. loudest guy there. Exactly. You not know? like ridiculous, but you know I'm there. Yeah, and that's the, it's not exaggerating it to make the point. It's just actually an ingrained habit now. You know, so that's and that's something we, we touched on at the end of the practice. I was like, you guys have to start to bring that. It's like you'll never be a player ever if you can't bring some of that with on top of the attention to detail and the intensity in small areas, the stops and starts, it's like that we did this one gap up drill where I was, I had them kind of like go on the whistle. They turn back on the whistle. They'd go up again on the whistle. They turn back like over and over. And the guy had to keep re gapping up. And I was saying the the easy one is the first one where you're right with them. I was like, when I blow that whistle to transition, that's the, where the hard work is like getting back, back up and moving your feet up. And that is just not intense. Like there's no urgency there. And that's where I'm finding the holes. And that's stuff that isn't taught. It's not taught at camps. You're, like your skills coach doesn't, unless you have a really good skills coach, which I haven't seen a lot of them. There's not a lot of that that's um, mentioned. And like speaking of all this stuff, we had a question about it. I'll touch on it now. Um, one of our guys that was here last summer sent me a text and he was saying that he plays in Europe and he was saying that um, he's struggling with some of the on ice cues in terms of communication. And he was kind of like, what do I say what are the words? What are the um, 
what are the things I should be mentioning to my teammates in the game, in the actual flow of the game about talk. And so for me, there's not a lot to say about it other than you have to be talking. What you say doesn't necessarily matter a whole lot to me. It's just a, one word, a quick thing that indicates to the people around you what you're doing, what the role is, or what they need to be doing if they need direction. So I was, I was saying to, in our text, like, there's not like a big discussion that you have to have on the ice and be like, Hey man, like make sure that you go take that guy over yeah, there. Take yeah. We're not right. You know what I mean? It's just yelling like, go stay. I go, my guys here, whatever quick. So that things are clear because I was noticing that even practicing this, like there's guys get lost just because they don't say anything and it's all quiet. What do you got? You got something? No, cause I'm thinking about this <laughs> one guy. I think, his, I think his name was last name was Lake played for Kitchener. Rangers. Yeah, his last name was Lake. He was tough too. And we we're going to a face off one day and he looked <laughs> he was being an idiot, but he was tough as nails. So you I think Alan Lake, maybe. Anyways, uh we're playing in Kitchener and he was lined up the face off and he looks at his winger, looks at me, and looks at his winger and goes, Play A five three five. Do you know what A five three five is? It's the rub. <laughs> so I was going to the take rub the face five, off five. and I'm like Crying, laughing. <laughs> he, he gave me. He gave me the. Uh, yeah, that's hilarious. Like he came in like so serious. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Play five three yeah. five. <laughs> <laughs> Means nothing. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah. You don't need a big paragraph or anything, and it's pretty. It's it's Daniel. Daniel. It's a pretty <laughs> common sense. Where do you want the puck? Deep. Yell deep. Right. <laughs> Drive the net here. Here. It's it's there's there's nothing else you need to know. Now, what what I will say on that though is the time where you have the conversation is. Uh, go, when you go on the bench, you know, after you're coming off from a shift, that's where you have conversation about more detail. Like, Hey, when this happens, you go here, I'll go here or whatever. And then when you're on the ice, you just have to yell one word now and they should know what you talked about before. So I think more of the problem solving part of it. Oh, would for come sure. On the your bench. line mates, right? Your line mates are, you're making a play. It's like, Hey, did you see me going to the net there? What were you thinking there? Why you, why why don't you get the shot off where there's rebounds or I if I'll shoot looking for the far pad, okay you know when I'm in trouble I'm gonna throw it behind the net so now it's like net net that's depending on I mean you don't have to be but what does he mean by net I mean behind the net or to the net so if you're if you're deep like you figure it out right like it's not common it's not that hard yeah and then so. the the last part about that is the on the bench stuff too I was noticing when you talk to each other like you have to remember that you're not each other's coach. You're each other's teammates. And I find that I'm having conflict with some of our guys, which is common to every team, where the guys come off and they're they're bitching at each other. It's not off. yeah, it's not coming off talking about the game. It's coming off like, yeah. why aren't you moving the puck? I'm open, I'm wide bro, I, I'm wide open. Why are you not hitting me? Like whatever. It's some kind of comment like that, which will obviously not be effective. So that's the only other thing is be conscious of how your what your messaging is to your buddy. Well, all that stuff's learned too. Yeah. You learn sure. that because you can come across cross saying like whatever like are you blind like pass like move the puck and it's like legit and maybe didn't see you so it's maybe the question that you learn that you don't just sometimes you do though sometimes you do give a guy you know a, a pile of shit sometimes it's just like god what are you seeing out there i'm not seeing like little things like that yeah for sure um i have one more but I'll, i'm gonna defer that to next week so this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the powertech online membership program if you've been listening to Andy and I wondering, hey, how are they able to get all this podcast content out there? Well, that's because of our members. For just $9.99 a month, you can get access to our online video library, including hundreds of videos of Coach Andy teaching and have the option for consultation calls with Andy or myself to go over anything you need. We can cover training, nutrition, coaching, parenting, agents, the junior college hockey path, whatever's of interest to you. You'll also be able to participate in our popular Ask Me Anything episodes, have access to special discount codes, and be given priority for any Powertech in-person camps or events. If you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, this is the best way to do it. Visit powertechhockey.ca slash memberships or find the link in the description of this video to learn more. So today, this kind of all, all those things we kind of talked about will work into offense's own play as well, whether that's like communication, small details, feet moving. So all that will apply to today as well. So keep that kind of in the background as we're talking, but we're going to finish the um, little basics mini series that we did with offensive zone stuff today. So uh, the most popular videos, which makes sense, is always how can I score more goals? That's always the, the most popular thing that people want to watch. And the problem with that question is 
there's a lot of different things that happen in the game. There's a lot of different situations. There's a lot of different types of skills you need in different situations to be able to execute and score. So there's not ever one word answers to anything. And like we said in the last two, anything that we talk about from a tactics standpoint or positional standpoint is always just like foundational things. And then you have to be able to make decisions and make plays or do what your coach is asking or, 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 and kind of build off of um, this. But this is all very like one-on-one understanding where you should be and what kind of things you should be thinking about. Um, so we can start uh, offensive zone stuff. Is there anything from like the philosophy or mindset standpoint, kind of like we did with the other two episodes that you think of as like a primer for offensive zone um, when you're working on attacking or trying to get to the net or trying to score goals or where you should be on the ice or anything like that? Well, I don't know if it's the same type of philosophy because my f- kind of philosophy, my, 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 my thoughts, I don't want to say my philosophy, my thoughts on ov- offense is that um, not it's not all taught. Like there's certain structure things that are that are good, but you know you'll hear a lot of coaches actually not coach offensively because they want to take care of the D zone. They might take care of some neutral zone, and then they a lot of coaches will say that offensive zone you play, and that's your zone. But you'll hear that a lot. I'm not really opposed to that to a certain degree, but then to a certain degree you want that. You, there is still still some structure like when it comes to the four checks and stuff. But I think when coaches talk about that, it's more when you have the puck on your stick, you guys kind of create your own stuff. Don't worry too much about it. So, um, but from a philosophy of a, of the offensive zone, I think an underused area of the offensive zone is behind the net. That's one thing I would say. Uh, the offensive zone is uh, um, a place um, when you're forechecking and stuff like the, the, it's a great place to take away time and space from people to, to create turnovers, obviously. The, the more you can get on people, the more, um, the quicker you can get on guys and direct guys. You, you can kind of dictate a lot of the play from the offensive zone. And if it's about scoring goals that we're asking about, talking about, then the other philosophy would be that if you're an actual, like, especially the higher levels you go, the more important it is that you get to dirty areas and you do the dirty, hard shit. Um, so when you're when you're a youth player, and we've said this in many podcasts before, being a goal scorer at seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, even sixteen, does not necessarily make you a goal scorer because goalies are small. Defend defenders aren't really defending like like I shouldn't say they're not defending, but you're not playing against the highest quality players all the time. You could score from odd angles because you're playing against. Um, watered down goalies. So if you have a good shot, even at 14, 15, 16, you have a good shot, sometimes that'll just be enough to to get by and get you some goals. Uh, you can shoot from the farther out areas when you're young and it'll appear like you can score some goals. Um, goalies could be small like at the real young levels. So if you learn how to lift it early, you're going to get goals. But as the game progresses, the habits that you create when you're young and even in junior, will either transfer or not transfer if you become a pro or from midget or U16 to junior to college. The, the habits are the most important things. So, you know, I was talking to a, a scout the other day about a player. They were saying it's not, we don't care how much this player scores. It's, a, it's, it's how he gets them and how that's, this player has less. But... It's the way he gets him. He said it's always in the dirty areas working his ass off. Because there's not the lucky ones where there's bounces all over. So that's translatable goals, right? So anyways, that's kind of my philosophy, not a philosophy, but a thought a thought for the offensive zone. And um, obviously, a lot of people love playing the offensive zone. <laughs> but there's two sides to the offensive zone, believe it or not. There's the offense, offense, and then there's the offensive, defensive side of the offensive zone the defensive side of the offensive zone which is you know whatever yeah we'll get we'll get, we'll get into yeah. that so two two thoughts on that first i'm noticing this now to coaching is i find the teaching of offensive zone play to be exactly what you said it's like it's i i constantly find myself saying to guys like you have to be able to make a play like you have to see what's there the only thing i can do is give you like loose structure like a couple rules of thumb that come to mind are depending on the four check stuff you do is the the F3 high thing is pretty standard in terms of a structure. 
and trying to create two-on-ones or outman people, if you call that a structure. And then outside of that, it's you need to be able to make make plays. I can speak for even at very like high levels of hockey, there's not a ton of set plays that you're running. Where in the defensive zone, there's there are set plays that you, you can run. There are set things that you're doing where it's like, when this happens, this happens. When this happens, this happens. And in the offensive zone, there isn't a ton of that. There are some exceptions, obviously, where you run certain plays, but there's not a ton of this is our play in the neutral zone. It's more like these are the options that could be available, and then you guys have to decide and play the, the game now. So I think that that's the same. The only thing that um, I'll say about younger kids, but even kids as they get up into junior, is they have a hard time, from what I can tell, is identifying where a high percentage zone is that they could score from. So a lot of times we talk about on the defensive side, like the house area or inside the dots, whatever. And I've noticed that kids don't realize when they're in good positions where they have an opportunity and they don't see that it is an opportunity. Um, so identifying those, those areas of the ice where you, if you get the puck to the net, there's a good chance something good will happen or you'll get some chaos or some momentum. I know I've noticed that. Um, and I've noticed as a, I don't know if it's a flaw necessarily, but a lot of times players feel like they have to get super close to the goalie to score. So there's always, you, you hear coaches say this all the time, we're making the, we're making the extra move or we're trying to force plays or whatever coaching cue you can think of in those situations. And I find kids younger, even more, but even older, like with even up to U 18s and into junior guys feel like they have to make the extra move right into the crease to make a deke on the goalie and score. And that's only one way to score. And it's a low percentage way to score. So if you can start to identify some of these other ways of scoring goals, that isn't just, I have to carry the puck through, get as close to the goalie as possible to get a goal. That's a very common mindset that I've noticed for higher skilled players, even um, because they have the skill to be able to get around guys and maybe burn guys or, or get it to the net hard. They feel like that's what they have to do. Also you know? to add to that, and that's a very good point that you made. Because as you were talking, I said I think another philosophy is guys don't shoot enough, and they shoot to score too much. And that might sound like a weird thing to say, but as to your point, is um, is they is play should be made out high if you can to get guys moving and goalie moving early. And if you screw up, you're not on top of the goalie. But um, I think another another thing with that is a lot of kids that. There's there's a couple things here. Some guys don't move, don't shoot, because they think in their head that they're being selfish. So if it's a two on one, then you'll see a guy creep in. It's like they're looking. Oh, sh sh they know they should shoot, but they know they got a goal score or whatever, and they're thinking, should I shoot? Should I pass? Should I? I, I need to pass it. I'll look like a pug hog. And then the next thing you know, they run out of real estate or whatever, or maybe they shoot and it's like a little bit late. And then you have other guys that are maybe a little bit insecure about their shooting, not because they can't shoot, but because they like, I'm talking the higher levels now where their ice, let's say their ice is limited or they're put in situations where they've got a 40 goal scorer on their left side and they come in on a two on one and they, if anyone's going to score, who probably will, if you got a 40 goal scorer on your, right. If you right, like Mary Lemieux, and Wayne Gretzky, when they're coming on that three on two in the Canada Cup in 1987, Larry Murphy went to the net knowing there's no chance he's getting the puck. Gretzky, in his head, knew he was giving it to Lemieux. But, like, if something, I mean, they're the smartest players in the world. But so he's thinking, okay, I got the best goal scorer in the world. He's getting the puck. It's just a matter of when. So, like, you just change that to a kid like that's maybe playing junior. He's on a two on one and he's got a 40 goal score and he's sitting there going, I shoot and don't score. Like it goes, you don't have an hour to think about this, but you're thinking, okay, this guy, I got to get it to him. Got to get it to him. And the next thing you know, it's the last minute play. So like, there's a different mindsets that go into this as well. And, and so like, like in different zones, that's why you have like different phrases that actually make sense, right? You don't play with the puck at the blue lines. If, it, if you want to, if you want to win, dump it in. If you want it out, dump it out. Like off the glass and out, like all these different things. When in doubt, shoot. These are, these are cliche sayings for a reason because they're, they actually yeah. are truisms. Yeah, for sure. If a truism nice. is a word, Good word. Good right? Word. So, anyways, I, I, I think the same same thing, and I'm noticing that with guys. I I make it a point to say this to guys a lot. Is I'll never 
be upset as a coach with you trying to make a play. <clears throat> if you try to, even if you try to go toe drag a guy and they stop you and what whatever, unless you're doing a repeated mistake in a bad area, that's where I'll start to get upset after a while. But if you're in the corner and there was a guy open and instead you tried to go around, like I'm not going to be mad at you for trying to go around a guy or make a move or whatever. And same thing if you're on a, a play where you keep passing it when you could have shot, like I'm not going to be mad at you for doing that. But at, to be a good player, you have to be able to identify when to hold the puck, when to shoot the puck, when to when I'm in a good area where if I shoot, I could score. Like we were just talking about, I saw a clip of, right before we started recording of Brett Hall and uh, playing in one of the all-star games like way back. And what a release on this guy. And this exact video that I watched, his shot, the shot that he got off actually wasn't a good shot. But he got it off so quick and he was in a good area that the goalie just couldn't find it. And it ended up going like through his arm into the net or whatever. And it wasn't, uh, he made two dangles and then ripped it far down. You know, it was, he was in, he identified, and he was one of the best at this, identified that he's in a good area of the ice, separated himself from a defender. And he's like, he knows in his head, if I get the puck in this area, it's come on and off my stick right away. And how many goals did he get like that? You know, and, and those are things that I'm finding are missing. I think guys, because of the skill game that is now super popular, we touched on this a bit last episode on how everyone wants to do the silky stuff. That's all fine when it's appropriate, but it's overdone in the offensive zone a lot from what I see, particularly youth hockey, even into junior hockey. Everyone feels like they have to make the extra move or get it a little bit closer or whatever. When if you're inside the house or you're inside the dots, even as a, as a defenseman from the point, you're in a good spot to get the puck to the net. Like these are high percentage plays, you know, and that is something that is not identified very well in the offensive zone. So that's kind of my only two cents that I'll add um, on that stuff from the, from the offensive zone perspective. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what are your thoughts on, you kind of touched on it already a little bit in terms of systems or structure in the offensive zone, how much of that um, do you teach or when do you teach it, whether that's four checks or in zone setups or whatever, when we're talking five on five um, versus just letting them play. So like when, when are you looking at one versus the other? Okay. So if you're just, if you just let kids play, then it's, then it's, you can't correct. You have to give them some sort of structure. So can you pass me a marker? So like when, when you give structure, like some structure and some principles and stuff that can you see either side of the board as well? It's all good. Um, when you give some direction, then you can do some, cor some correction as well. If you have zero direction, then there's nothing to correct or to help them with. And our goal as coaches is to help them. Right. So like, where do, where do we want to not so much enter with the puck? That's maybe a little bit of an older thing, but we, if we're doing entries, zone entries, we want to, if we can get inside the dots, Obviously, let's get inside the dots because it gives us options. But, of, of course, that can contradict itself if you're beating a guy wide. You can stay wide, right? But if you have a chance, if you're coming in the neutral zone, into the zone, if you can get it in the crate from the middle of the ice, creates options, and it makes D have to think a little bit, right? So that's that's one thing. But now it's just a matter of what philosophy do you want. So there's there's different things. Do you have the puck? Do you have – do they have the puck? Do we have the puck? Or is it a 50-50? And that all matters. Yeah. Right? So, so Sorry, are you done? Uh, well, no, that, that would just determine what type of structure. If we have yeah. the puck, we can do whatever the hell we want. So, yeah. So, let's let's start walking through some of this stuff. So, I want to go through, like, a couple of tactics things like this. And then we'll talk about positioning, like, indiv as individual players. Okay? So, if we start, like, most basic, let's say it's just a, a four check. So, we don't have the puck. Puck's in the corner they're going to be the first one to get it. So we're doing a four check now in the offensive zone. What's there's a million different four checks to do, but let's just go like super basic. What, who's doing what, and how do you know where to go, what to think, and what's our goal like okay. on the four check? I'll just use this side because yeah. this is the cl side closest to me mm -hmm. and I got alligator arms. So, <laughs> so if a D goes in to retrieve a puck, okay, that's the D. Um, the first guy in, it's not the center, it's not the winger, it could be a D, it could be whoever it is. The first person in, your job is to put pressure on the player. Okay. Now we can put pressure on the outside going in, and some people can do that as long as you have help. But what this does is gives them a lot of room to make space. So what we're what we try to do in general, 
is make him choose the right option for us. So when we come in on a four check is we want to, where, where do we want to, we want to protect the middle of the ice no matter what. So if we can four check on an inside angle with our stick, for, well, his stick back is to it. So we want to, we want to guide him so that he's climbing up the wall or forces the puck up here. Because if he does that, if we can keep him on the outside, then he's got to make plays in this area. That's not a lot of t time to make play. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's similar, so the, similar to when we talk about neutral zone, how you're yes. you're shrinking his yes. ability to have options, yes. make decisions. Yes. So like if he's course. climbing up the ice, you don't go straight at him. You cr take a little bit of an angle, so you force him to come up the ice, and your stick is taking away the puck. You do, some levels you can't hit, but you can take the body anyways. Like I mean, you just so what's called hit and pin. So this would be, that would be that guy. You hit and pin him if you can. So what that allows him to do is stop his feet moving and hopefully cough up the puck. That's the first job. The second person would be coming in and kind of reading if he, which way he's got this guy. But typically if we're doing it right, then the second guy is going to be right on top of that to take a second puck. Right? If That's if the, everything is working properly. And then the third person you would have in, which would be, let's just say it's, let's just say for um, the sake of this, it was the right, the centerman came in and took him, the right winger came in to go steal, steal a pucker to keep the puck live, and the left winger came in and he's playing the high guy. Why the high guy? Because now, until we have possession, he needs to be defensively aware. Right? If he just goes in there, which some guys have three guys in, it doesn't matter, it could be outnumbering, but this is just a philosophy. So that if a puck gets loose from the other team, he could either seal it off or forecheck the other way. Or if you get possession, you're in kind of on top of the dots, to high, high circle to get a pass where you can shoot or make a play. Right? So the, and the F3 guy is important that you don't go in a bad position. So a lot of guys, when you do in practices, you'll see the F3 guy kind of hang out in here. Or if we get a puck that squirts loose, He's in this area. So what would be the problem with that is that typically you're going to have defenders, and I'm going to put D as defenders. It could be a forward, whatever, but these are where the defenders hang out. So if you're hanging out there, it's really tough to get a pass. So you're better off being on the strong side in this area here to be able to get a pass. Maybe the puck comes up the wall or it goes to the other side and you can do a hard four check. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? For sure. So okay. let's so let's let's back it up here. I want to go um position by position again through this quick. So if we first of all talk about the F1, F2, F3 thing because this is still confusing for people that don't know. The notation F1 is like forward one, first person in, F2 second in, F3 third in. So when we use that notation, that's all that means. So back to back to our F1 guy. If we do a, like a standard uh, four check where we got first guy coming middle of the ice, second guy kind of go down the wall, third guy coming up into the middle. So talk a little bit about each of those one more time. F1, cutting the middle of the ice. F2, why would he go down the wall? And then F3 in that high pocket. And then where are D at? So I just want to like clear notation on the board. So yeah, F1, yeah. where's he at? Okay, What's pucks his on this side again. Yeah. So the, the pucks in this area, someone's going to retrieve. F1 would be coming in. Cutting off the ice. So just like in the neutral zone we talked about the other day, if we come at if we if we come at him like this, then he's got all that ice to work with. If we come at him like this, because we're taking away this lane the best we can, so we're trying to force him up the wall. So this would be your F one. Mm -hmm. F one's job is to take that guy. Yep. Right to guide him, to hit him, to pin him, to eliminate him from Earth. Yep. <laughs> Right, so he can't make another play. Yeah. And one of the things that you want to do is like if a guy makes a play, that's why if you get a chance to hit, if you're just hitting or pinning at least, pinning means just keep him on the boards for a split second. It keeps him um, away from uh, being a threat again. Yeah. So, F, sorry, so now if you can't hit and pin this guy, so let's say F1's just going to do this push, but it's clear that that D is going to get it and start to move up the wall. Yeah. This would be where we get in. F1 is now in his back pocket, pushing him up. This is where we would have F2 in the role of going more yeah. down the wall now. Yeah, so the D, the D is, maybe that D or four, whatever it is, is coming up the wall or taking this space. So this guy is going to just stay on him. Your stick will be is forcing that as much as you can to the outside. And the F2 
will be coming d- down that wall, even maybe this way, maybe the, depending on what your coach wants, but you're taking away more space to the middle so that he's just basically running out of room, right? So that would be F2. So we got F1, four checking, F2, wall pressure, F3, high. So that's F3, sorry. F3 would be a high guy to to be like um, uh, insulation, you know, like extra extra four checker, getting a loose puck, uh, a loose puck here being an option for a pass. The D simply you're taking that wall, the other D taking this wall. Yep. For the most part. Right. So now, if we not touch- this wall, the middle of the ice. Right. So if we touch on F3 for a second, um, this is where this is a question I was going to ask a little bit before is when you're in the offensive zone, how much defensive mindset do you think should be present if at all at all times like when you're in the offensive zone like what is that i mean it kind of depends on coaching but whatever so this d we got an f1 going for the puck he doesn't have the puck yet he's just hunting it down f2 still hunting f3 they're all in the defensive zone you're all in the defensive mindset right now you're aggressive but you're, this is not your possession yet. Like it's, it might, and even if he doesn't have the puck, it's still 50-50. No one has a possession. So the job is, is to force a play, like to steer a guy to where you want him to go. So you want to put him, you want to put this D in your crowd, like where you can outnumber them. So these guys are kind of thinking fast. This guy's maybe thinking a little slower. So if the, you, if they don't, if you don't have possession, if they 50-50 puck, meaning no one has possession yet, or the other team has possession of the puck, you're thinking defense more than you are offense. You think so because we want to make sure. And now some guys don't do as high of a F3, but it doesn't matter. F1, F2, even if you're F3 here, waiting for a loose puck, you have to be in a position. This is what you hear the term being on top of the puck, right? If, because if the puck squirts out, if you have a player here, player here, player here, and the puck squirts out, you're now below the puck and you're back checking. So what you're doing, the mindset of an F3 guy is you're looking for if, and it should be your first thought, if the puck squirts loose, like say it comes here, then you can get real hard on that play. Or if they get possession, like clear possession, like coming out, then you, it's a couple steps and you're on top, you're play, acting as a D guy, Right. And if you do have possession, now it's a whole different mindset. If you guys, if your team has possession, now you're thinking offense, totally offense. You're looking for to be in a pass option. But no matter what, though, like like some coaches don't like. Like I had a team where I wouldn't, I didn't want to have three guys deep because where there's that bad. So I always kept a higher guy. And these guys, like, so if this if it went that side, he can go, he can go, and then this guy would have to be F three. But, um. It's yeah, it's a safety valve for your offense. Right. So let's do that exact play now. So let's say pucks in the corner, okay. F one, F two, F three is high. F one, F two, F three. Yep. Yeah. And let's say that puck just releases D, to the other corner. D. So that yeah. puck's here, it swings to the other so side. What's happening? Either a play or a defensive uh, Whatever happens. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's this guy is coming down hard because you know the puck, puck's going this way. So this guy's going hard as he can to take that guy your f1 would be supporting and your f2 would just slip out to this area yeah now he's now he's f3 right right and then your d is just shifting right right beautiful so if that play now if we just kind of draw the same positioning on the other side so we have our f1 f2 f3 on the other side yep so f1 f2 in the corner yep f3 up top DD. So now let's say that puck starts to come up the wall, but it's still not our possession. So let's talk about um, on the def- for the defenseman. Let's talk about the idea of holding the line versus not. The, what the weak side defenseman is doing, and then what is the posture mindset of the forwards now as the puck starts to come up the wall to maybe get out of the zone, maybe not. We don't know. Um, and then we'll go into possession after that. So last play here. Yeah. So. There's there's more than one thing that could happen, but let's just say the other team starts climbing up the wall. Well, that's why that's why this guy is here. He can start pressing right away. 
push, push, push. And then, as we said in our defensive zone or in our D zone, when you back check, you don't come up the wall. You start coming up up the middle like this or taking guys like that, right? So, um, so now it's a now it's a function of this guy's pressing, and if this guy sees that there's like not a lot of risk of, of, of stepping in, then you got two guys eliminating one, right? So that's fine. But if you see like numbers, like the other team has two numbers coming at you, then it's probably not your best to pinch down. It's probably uh, release a little bit and let the back checkers take over. And then as far as the defense or the uh, weak side D is – it's it's you're hinging like you're being the you need a last guy back so when you see pressure coming out this guy just comes back through the neutral zone and gives him a, a release valve so if the puck beats this guy you know this d's not stuck here he's already creating a two-on-one you start you're looking for help from your back checkers does that make sense okay clear i know it's clear to you i just i think but it's it's clear like i know for us going through it this is like very one-on-one things but it's super helpful even for i'm even having like some people reach out for these episodes that oh, i know i see that it. are that are actually like their coaches are higher level players yeah. higher level coaches saying like it's nice to remember that there are basics to this you, you know it's funny yeah so that's true and i you know I'm, I'm as you know like for anybody watching sometimes i'm reluctant to do these because it is the basics but the basics are the basics the foundations are the foundations you can build off that but very funny because Paulie called me. Uh, he was, he saw the one on the D zone. He goes, "Hey, can I call you?" So Paulie coaches in Europe. He won a Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens. He played pro for whatever Paul DiPietro. So he called. He goes, "Yeah, I want to go over the D zone with you because he, he coaches, right?" So and it's that, that wasn't the rocket science one. And he goes, uh, "Anyways, there, we had a couple older people who think that they know hockey say, yeah, but yeah, but it's like no, that's hockey. You can change it. Like it was a basic D zone structure, right?" But Paulie was like, yeah, he goes, uh, and he was asking me questions about what I thought about, you know, when they switch and all those different things. And then, and I, I said, you know, it was for youth. He goes, yeah, I know. So, but also the, a lot of junior teams use that philosophy. Um, anyways, he was just saying like, no, no, but I like going over that shit with you because it's, you know, I like thinking about it. Yeah. He goes, cause I'm more of the offensive coach. So anyways, I'm reluctant sometimes to do it because I don't think with most of the players that I deal with or di did deal with were typically older. And I forget sometimes that the coaches, like there's some coaching cues in there. Like, even if you know, like if you, even if you're coached at a little bit of a level and you're actually not a bad coach, sometimes it's a coaching cue that could be what, what my job is to take away space and you have numbers and that could be a cue that they go, Oh, okay. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good reminder by that, by the way. Yeah. So I know F1, F2, F3 doesn't seem like a lot. To us. I feel like I'm wasting my, not my time, but I feel like most people aren't are going to get that, but apparently not. No, but, but even as a coach, like even for me, I've I, playing, I've played at a super high level. Like I, we've done all this stuff, but now when, when I go to coach or when I go to try to teach someone, you can get so advanced that you forget what the job was in the first place, you know? So it's nice to be able to say, even for more advanced coaches or more advanced players, when things get more complicated and systems get more complicated, it's important that you can go back to, I'm having you do this more advanced thing because remember what the basic job is. You know, the basic job is this, and I've now layered five things on top of that. Don't forget that this is the primary thing that you have to focus on, right? So it's, that's why I, I like doing this stuff. So if we switch it now to more like possession stuff. So if we have, uh, let's say a puck down low, um, F1, whatever it has the puck, whoever matter, has yeah. the puck. So I want to talk about two things. First of all, I want, I want you to talk about the concept. This is like very basic hockey about creating triangles, number one. I want to talk about the idea of cycling, number two. And then from there, you can take it into whatever in terms of tactics to now start to attack and score goals. So just as a more, maybe a little bit of a primer for me, I remember as a kid, no one taught me either of those things. And then I remember as a higher level player, those things not really being what they were when they were first taught. So I remember we'd go when I was 12 years old, as an example, we'd go play Elgin Middlesex and they would cycle just like for the sake of cycling. And we sucked so we could never get the puck from them. But I remember they would just do that thing where it was just like the tornado effect in the corner where they just kept sh shifting it down. And then they would always have that type of triangle setup thing when they were in the offensive zone. And it was really hard to defend one because we just weren't very good. 
but two, they always just seem to have guys in open ice. So maybe t touch on those two things first, the idea of like creating triangles or however you want to talk about it. And then the idea of the cycle or whatever, why is that, why is that used and why do people talk about the cycle? Yeah, okay. So it's real, real simple, real, maybe even stupid. If this is, a, this is a, I'm not going to put F1 or whatever. This guy has the puck and there's another forward here, and another forward here. You can't make a play, <laughs> right? If you have. Yeah, but okay, but why though? Like it seems obvious. No, why okay, can't you no, make no, a play? I, I will. Yeah. If, if, if you if you have guys in a line like this, you can't make a play. Like you have a puck. Where is it going? There's a, you can't defend. Nothing effective is going to happen out of that. You're not creating a two on one. You're not creating. You're not not outnumbering anybody. So what you what you're talking about being in a triangle is like if this guy has the puck, we want to see a triangle. So what you're doing is you probably have a defenseman here and. A, for, a forward somewhere so whatever so we're either wanting to look at a another forward here or another forward here so that we can get this guy to move his feet somewhere he comes at you it's a you, you beat a guy with one pass so that's what you're trying to do you're always trying to create two on ones if you can and then so sometimes if you don't have a play right so we're looking at like typically what you want to have is someone at the net Typically, what you want to have is someone at the net, right? So you got, if anything comes to the net, you're taking, you, you got rebounds, you got tips or whatever. You're doing someone working in the corner behind the net or whatever. This is when you have possession or trying to get to the net. And then you have someone that's ready to be an uh, outlet pass for a shooter. Now, this guy could be an outlet pass too, but this is a triangle still, so you can make plays. So a lot of the times, if you have... A guy with possession and you got someone like okay so we got it as we said someone trying to flush you out of the zone and they start both put, taking you up the wall or you're trying to bring him with you okay so let's say you start going to the wall and there's another def defender here right on the other team here trying to leak you out trying to take you out well there's only so far you can go maybe you can make that pass maybe you can't but this is where the cycle comes in where he, he might be flushing out he might be pressing you and you don't have that play well, this guy automatically knows that this would be a safe play for him to put the puck because we have guys moving. So as this guy moves, this is the cycle now, is where, where this guy moves to get the puck, this guy's going here, and this guy's rotating down. And you can continue that cycle, getting these people to move their feet. and You're creating chaos, looking to create two-on-ones, or creating, oh, finally you get a lane for a shot. Yes. Right? Yes. That's what we're trying to do. That's Okay, so this is exactly where... I wanted to go. So people talk about the cycle as um, it's just like that automatic keep shooting it down the wall. And I remember as a kid, just mindlessly doing the drill of shooting it down the wall without understanding the purpose. And the purpose, as you just said at the end, is you need to try to create movement among the defenders because that's the only way space opens up, right? Because if everybody stands still all the time, then it, put one guy in one spot, one guy in another spot, we have the area covered. Nothing's going to happen. So the only way you can open up space to do things is by creating movement. So that's why you'll never see guys standing still for very long if they're any good at playing hockey because movement is what creates the lanes. Movement is what creates the chances. So, for example, you start off in that triangle setup, but you have no options. Well, you don't just stand there. You have to move. So Someone has to move. Someone has to move. So call it a cycle. Call it whatever you want. But guys have to be able to get into open space, and guys have to create space. So the guy with the puck moving draws guys to him. So there's space where they just were. Somebody fills into that area. Now we can make passes, make plays. Whether it's a cycle down the wall or not, doesn't matter. It's that you're getting people into open space so you can create shooting lanes. Keep those guys moving until they make a mistake, until they open up a lane they shouldn't have, until they lose a guy in coverage, until something offensive happens where you can now start to attack inside the dots, inside the house, whatever, to get that, that kind of opportunity, right? So those are the two two things I want to talk about um, in terms of that. So if we get from the puck being down low, moving the puck up to the defenseman now. So if we have a forward with the puck in the corner and we're in our whatever triangle setup, whatever it is, let's say we got that guy in the corner and he moves it up to the point man. Let's just run through this kind of idea. So let's assume that D wants to get the puck to the net. Um, what kind of happens from the defense perspective? What are those two D up top doing? And then how are forwards now adjusting that the puck is high? Yeah. 
Uh, first thing is, is when the D gets the puck, you want to have your head up. You want to be able to, see, the reason you want to have your head up, and I know this seems very basic, but just work with my, the junior guys yesterday with it. It's like with the D, I would spend a lot of time with the D. It's like, I like them catching pucks. Like I, I teach them how to do a hard catch so they can shoot or pelt, make a play right away with their head up. And the reason why you want to have your head up as a D, as a forward, any, anyone, but especially as a D shooting is because things happen really quick when you're, when you even glance down and look back up, things happen very, very quickly. So if you can learn the art of catching a pass while your head's up, the game immediately slows down and you can already see what's out there, right? So bottom line is if you get that puck and, and you got a, a lane then and you got traffic, then it's just get to the net or it's a step into the net. But typically what you want to do is you want to get the puck kind of coming to the middle of the ice, either through skating uh, or a D to D pass, right? Cause this guy's in the middle already. So that, what that does, again, just to your point earlier, if you don't move, then it's easy to defend. So right away, as that starts going in the middle of the ice, it could only be two, three feet and it could be 50 feet, right? But you want to get that puck moving to get everybody a little bit of chaos. When the puck goes up, like rule, the rule for me is the puck's up, we go to the net. That's kind of the rule. Now that doesn't mean all three guys have to go to the net. What it means is there's going to be like at least someone for a tip or a rebound or, to, or a screen. And then this guy, maybe he makes that pass up and he becomes an outlet pass or he becomes like, like almost like a power play bumper guy, more to the middle of the ice. But whatever you want to do from that point is fine. Puck comes up. We want to kind of gain that middle of the ice. And we're looking at shots or an outlet pass. But we want to get guys to the net for traffic. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Not much to say. So uh, yes, but no. No, but yes. So these for these guys going low to high, one thing that I find with Fords is one thing is not using the D in general. That's one thing that I notice is you have two other players. So a lot of times guys get caught up. It's like the three forwards down low are the only guys that can have the puck. And especially if you're getting heavy pressure down low, moving it up just relieves pressure a lot of times because everybody has to adjust out. So that's one thing. But then the other thing is once those D have the puck, forwards trying to find ice that's actually usable so if we assume like one guy is at the net being your screen guy or your traffic guy or whatever, so we have one guy's at the net, so he's good. Our D has the puck at the point. Those other two forwards, you need to, this is where the thinking part again comes in. There's no system here. It's just you have to find an area of the ice where you can be used if your D needs you, where you can be a threat if you can be a threat, and where you're not just running into the same areas that everybody's already into so on the on the one hand it's yeah we need to get traffic to the net we want to make sure that we have guys going to the net whatever but on the other it's you have to be able to identify oh there's open space just off to the side or just a little bit higher or maybe after i give it to that di I stay to the outside by the wall to be a release for him or whatever and that's where the thinking part comes back in from the offensive perspective and guys that are really good in the offensive zone that's what they're really good at they can find the open pockets of the ice where they can constantly be an option, turn into a threat, make a pass, whatever it is. So it's not just auto up to the D, everybody run and run to the net. You know, you have to have some brain about where on the ice is a good area to be. Yeah. So example, this is another kind of philosophy that I always go by. It's um, a lot of people like to make the long, beautiful plays. But for me, the 5, 10, 15 foot passes are the best. So like for that example, as you said, so like say F1 had the puck, we had where forward had a puck, another guy got F, X's and O's and all that shit. <laughs> say there's three forwards here and this guy happens to get the puck up to his D. If he stays down low, right, without any movement, then you're looking at three guys in front of the net here. So what do you have in between? You probably have three, four or five defenders in between. So this getting pucks through is very, very difficult, especially at higher levels. So maybe the play is, I'm just saying maybe because it's one play, is when the puck comes up here, you already got one or two guys here, is follow it up a little bit so that when he does come across and this defender, I'll put a D here, I got Ds for no reason, this D, D kind of chases him. And if you come up like this, then that little short pass, 10-foot pass, Maybe that's what beats this guy. Now you've got 
two on ones going this way. So it's like using different areas of the ice, as you said, but you always want to support a puck. So there's another reason when I talk to my players about when we do passing drills is to move your feet because, you know, this is a philosophy in general, right? If we, if this guy does not move his feet and he moves it up to his D and he's waiting for an outlet pass and you have all these things, then he's not, if there's a bobble, he's not in a position to defend. He's not in a position to, to support. Right. So by moving your feet, you just automatically, just by taking one or two steps, if you move that puck, one or two steps means three or four because you're already up here and then you're reading the play nice and quick. Right. And then if you bobble it or whatever, then you're already moving. So, so that, anyway, that, sorry. No, no, that's perfect. Cause that leads right into my next thing. I don't know if this is a, something to do on the board or not, but maybe just a couple comments on, um, guys, forwards, defensemen, whatever, to your point about, they have to make the long bomb. They have to make the, the, the big play, the, cross ice pass through people and super common thing is just forcing forcing things that aren't there um so maybe just like a couple more comments on that about the simple plays the short game and how guys don't appreciate how good that is from an offensive perspective because if you if you're the high risk high reward guy that's fine but they're low percentage plays again right so it's like you have to be able to see that the simple plays are often or the simple, the easy plays are often the better plays, the more effective plays for that exact reason, as it's hard to defend, you know, it's easy to make a five foot pass. It's easy to make a 10 foot pass. It's not, it's not about the fancy play all the time, but again, in the era of the hyper skill hockey that everyone is obsessed with, like these basic things that actually are more effective get lost because you feel like you have to do the sauce you feel like you have to pass it through a guy. You feel like you have to hang on to it extra, do a spinorama, shake a guy, all this stuff, and you don't have to, especially when you're in the offensive zone in an attack mode. Like, you know the defending guys are going to be more intense on you. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah so, I, yeah, you're, to your point, is like it, it doesn't have to go D to D, down low, perfect. Hot. It's not going to work that way anyways, typically, because people have a hard time doing it on a power play, let alone five on five. So it's like a lot of hard work, a lot of, like, it's all that, maybe coming up the wall, it's a little play here. It's a cycle. It's using the net, using the net, because that's a, just a ball of confusion for most people, right? Can I go there yet or no? So like in a cycle or when you don't have, like it's really funny is a lot of people don't like to use this area of the ice. Well, Wayne Gretzky did it for a living, right? But I'm just going to ask a question without being a, a, a teacher here is if a puck if you if a player is carrying the puck behind the net, an offensive zone player carrying the puck behind the net, and you're a D here, and you got a forward here, and you got a D here, when you get to cross this line, what do we do? It's a good question because now it's like there's the net here. There's it's confusing because it's not really uh, a known area, especially so, in youth hockey. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Flip, yeah. flip it back to our D zone episode, right? That's what we talk, do it, they talk about the quadrant. Like this is the transition point, right? Whose zone is it? Right. right. So if you want to screw guys up, it's not like where you you want to get to the front of the net. But if you want to screw guys up, like you'd be surprised if you go here and you just slam the brakes on it's because it, some guys won't go. Maybe you get two guys go. But if like if you're feeling two guys, then you know it could be a a back door. It could be. You know, keep keep them coming because now they're going to have three, whatever. But anyways, my, not to get any other philosophy other than guys don't know what to do behind the net. And you'll talk to different coaches and they'll have all, all different re, all different philosophies on it. So some will say you stop here and you stop here and let them play back here. Okay, that's cool. But if the, now their heads are have to be on a swivel looking back, so who knows what's going on in this area. So it just ca causes confusion. So that's another area in the offensive zone where you can look at playing and creating space and thinking. And it's like, I'm not going to sit here and say, do this, this is the play, and this is why, because all D do this. That's not that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, try using it. And even when you're, sometimes you get in a cycle and you're, you know, you're working a puck all in here and it's fine. Using the back of that for a long cycle too, right, is learning, you know, a coach teaching like after whatever period of time, or maybe it's a cycle, like it comes up the wall and it comes back, comes up the wall, and it's like we already know that's going to be a long cycle. So instead of keeping the puck here, we know that this guy is going to release instead of going here, and you send that really long. So now you got to get all their D to shift sides. It's just a different philosophy. Maybe it opens it up. Yeah. So, anyways, just use the behind use behind the net 
uh, as a as an offensive weapon. So on that note, can you just can you draw that the D zone quadrants again? Just like kind of the the X, the big X. So if you notice, like, and what you can watch hockey, these are like the common where are the common areas that guys try to make a lot of offensive plays. One is here behind the net. Boom. Two is when wingers do that walkout around this area. And then three is you get your puck to your D and where are they going? They're trying to draw it here, right? So one transition area, two transition area, three transition area. It's always those areas are common. And it, that, that doesn't mean no plays can happen anywhere else. But those are common areas of the ice in the offensive zone that the team tries to get the puck because that is where the confusion happens. That's what creates chaos. You create movement around those lines and that's where issues start to happen on the D side, right? So that's just, that's great. Behind the net, any of those areas, right? Um, so we talked a little bit when we were talking about the forecheck about like the defensive mindset. Is, is there anything else um, from the dis- defensive side in the offensive zone that you think we should talk about or do you think that was fine from well, what we talked about before? Just, just like for coaches when you're teaching this is it's all about who has possession who may have possession and who and if you don't have possession that's i guess it's all the same thing if you have possession or not so if you're there is no point right so let's just say you, you you get you dump a puck in for example and this d is here and he's there's no question he's going to get the puck would it make sense for your f1 it sometimes it does Sometimes it does, but if he's like literally a zone away or half a zone away, does it make sense for him to rush? Probably more times than not. No. Right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Like in junior pro, you'll see a lot of guy like a deal stop behind the net and a forward will come anyways. And a lot of people say, well, what that? Why? Why? Like well, you, you're just letting them come over free. Well, you're, you're working them out of, out of the zone and, and typically we want to get him on his backhand side. So if you can read that, get him on his backhand side so he's having a hard time making a play. So if you can dig him out, put a, make him have, feel some pressure, um, then that's some of the reasons why. But if you're looking at this guy's going and you know, I'm, I'm talking mostly youth, youth hockey anyways, like why work your ass off to, to get nothing done? So that's where it's in the offensive zone, but maybe it's like we talked. So now you're just taking your neutral zone and you're putting it into the offensive zone. So if we go, for example, right? So if we were doing the one, two, two, like last week we talked about in the neutral zone, well, now they have full possession. So why would I go, uh, especially if I'm not a very good team or if I'm trying to clamp things down, why would I go hard? So what would I what I would do is maybe take a side for some one way. So this would be your first guy, right? Because they got possession. And they have Your second guy would be in the dots, third guy in the dots, and then you got your D and your D. So now if they come out, this side, the four or the D comes out this side. This guy gets underneath him, and this guy four checks this. This guy slides, slide, slide. So it's your your neutral zone in the offensive zone. That's all, right? If it's a 50-50 puck now, meaning the puck is or the D grabs it here, and there's a forward on him here, and or it's dumped in, and it's like a race for the puck. Well, now you're looking at a little bit defensive, but this guy's looking at taking the puck. The second guy's reading. Okay, it looks like we're going to get that puck. I need to support him as F2 and F3, right? And if you have possession, it's go nuts, put the puck right there. Beautiful. Um, the last thing I have here is uh, face-offs. So I just want to, I don't know, this might be another thing. Do you want to just talk about it or draw it out? I just want to talk win-loss in the offensive zone on a face-off. Go yeah. forward or just talk about it? I just talk about okay, it because, on. we just talk about it because there's just so many different um, variables to face-offs. Depends on what hand you are. Depends on, on, you know, do you purposely want to win one? Do you purposely want to lose one? Because you can make a lot of offensive plays on losing a puck, right? By sending guys towards the yeah, player. Do that. We used to do those so plays. So yeah. it, there's no real philosophy, but the the bottom line is um, you have to have some idea of what you're doing, right? So it, let's, for example, if we're is the is it on me or the board? Okay, no, 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 it's fine. So if you're on one side of the ice, um, you, you typically want to win it towards the boards or, or deep, right? So that you can get numbers on the puck. Um, that's basically the bottom line. If you lose a, lose a face-off battle, um, the other thing is if you lose a face-off battle, you want to make sure you're defending it well. So if the puck goes deep, just you send three guys. So that's why no matter what face-off, unless I'm trying to set my center free, <laughs> free 
like he was in jail. Like you always tie up your guys. Their first first job on every face off is to what I call squeeze, is make sure that you have possession or it's where you want it to be, or else you're defending. Um, but there's a, a, a you can draw up all kinds of face off plays and many of them will work. So the, the only thing I'll add is I was watching video of our our team's game uh, last weekend. Me and uh, Mac were watching it, and it's funny how like under an under it's such such an underappreciated part of the game is the face off. So we're watching how guys set for a face off, and most of them just don't. <laughs> Most of them don't set. Most of them aren't ready. Most of them aren't like ready to pounce on a puck. Most centermen, they're not ready to battle to win the puck. And the only thing that I'll add on that is whatever your plays are, whatever your coach wants, is you have to be ready to go and ready to battle for the puck. If you guys start with the puck, everything's way better. You know, you don't have to go work to get it now. You have it, you know? So if you do a little bit of hard work in the instant that the puck is dropped, a lot of times you'll win just because other teams don't care, you know? So that's the only thing I'll add with both the face off. Yeah. Well, to, to add to what you're added <laughs> is I, this is, the, this is where I think coaching is a real critical thing. A lot of kids don't hear you the first time. And then sometimes they don't hear you the fifth or the 10th. That's why it's really important that every time you explain something about the game to them, that you give them the reason why you're doing it and make it so that everything is important because everything is. So you can go and show them clips of an NHL game. You can show them clips of a junior or college game. You can show them clips of their own game. But when you're 10, you're not thinking. Like, if you're the centerman, I'm going to tell you what an 8, 9, 10-year-old guy thinks about if he's a good hockey player, uh, like a, a skilled hockey player. When he's 10, he's thinking how he can get the puck through that centerman's leg so he can go on a breakaway or go on a one-on-one. -on -one. That's what he's thinking. He's not thinking about his team, typically. At 10. And then you'll see that oh, some guys older because they want to get the goal and get the glory. So that's why it's important as coaches that you teach and understand or have your kids understand why things are important, right? And, and, and reward things that are not necessarily the highlight real stuff. So like, again, when I was, when I told you that I used to do film with Charlie's young team when they were little guys, I couldn't, I couldn't do a whole lot of uh, clips on high end stuff because there wasn't a whole high end lot of stuff to see. Plus, most of the guys, plus or and whatever the sentence is, most kids were not going to be able to pull off high end stuff. If they scored a a, a flipper from the corner, which we won a, a, a series by one of our guys, one of our better guys took. He was down in the like way down in the corner, and he went to shoot, and it was a flipper. And it, it bounced off the goalie and in, and we won a series cover that. And the guys were so pumped. Moms and dads were pumped. What a shot, Cam. Like, it was the best. It was like, actually, no, it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? But for the kids, yeah. it was the best, and we won yeah. the game and stuff. But if we were waiting for, like, a really good highlight offensive goal or defensive thing to praise and say, that's what I want, then you'd, be, you, you'd run out of video or you wouldn't have enough video. So that's why it was important for me to, like, when we did videos, we start, and I'd say, hey, okay, and we did. 20 minutes and let them do the talking face off would start and I said okay what's our jobs here again guys oh it's the squeeze okay great and where are we winning it back okay so the puck drops and I go I'll oh, stop it what did we do uh everyone got their guy and they'd be like yeah and I'm like so now they can high five each other they saw the little thing why is it important because they can't get the puck now we did our job there's pride there's there's uh okay I did something that makes my coach happy and that's you go through the game like that and, you know, now it's the offensive zone. We, did we have an F3? Like, if it's not even the F1, like, or the F1 was awesome. The F2 was good, but it was the F3 patient and did his job. Did the D do this? And you see them respond to that. Like, they have to know because they, they, they don't know. Just like a lot of coaches that are coaching don't really know why. Like, it might, some coaches are coaching and saying, oh, we lost the faceoff, or, oh, they scored off the draw. The other team scored off the draw. Like, why? It's like because there's jobs. Right, and if you do little things right, then things will be done properly. But kids will get it. So now you're you're not shocked at 16 years old or 17 when they're playing junior that the coach is snapping on them because they didn't tie up a guy on a face off. You know, and I know that I, for me, well, I know it seems like it's for someone that coaches at a high level. Say, well, who doesn't know this? But some coaches just don't. Right, Dude, Young, youth coaches. Man, even older coaches don't know. Man. 
Like you, we've talked, we've been talking to NHL guys about coaches and right. they're like, dude, this guy, he doesn't know anything. But it's even like an off- offensive draw, defensive draw, whatever. It's like, what hand should you take your draw on? So if you like, you're a left-handed shot. If you, if, if, if you're a left-handed shot and you're on the left side of the ice. That's your backhand win. It's your backhand. It's easier to win on your backhand. Mm-hmm. Actually, have you seen now a lot of guys are switching? Yeah, I know. Off the face-off, I've been noticing that NHL they're literally switching. So if they're left-handed, they'll switch on the right side. They'll switch to have their so their hand is curved. better. Eh? Yeah, they're like curved the wrong way to so that they have their backhand side both ways. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's not such a big movement, right? right. So you can get down low and just like and scrape the it. circle. But it's um, there's so many things, man. Yeah, yeah. So many no, things. It's good. Last thing, just a couple more things about the offensive zone before we kind of wrap up. Yeah. I believe you're wrapping. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. yeah, is don't be afraid to get shots. Um, you get in that, let's just put this down for one second. So don't be afraid to get shots. So we talked about three on ones, three on twos and all that kind of stuff. When you're coming in the zone, just a philosophy here is if you're, let's say it's a two on one, two on one, there's a D you got a forward, got a forward. Try to get the play done earlier rather than later. If it's done earlier, this guy has to think, this guy has to think, or the puck could even come back. You can make extra plays. But the bottom line is that you got to get the goalie to move. If the goalie moves, you increase your chances of goal scoring. If you don't, if you wait it out and you wait it out and you wait it out, it might work in your favor, but it leaves a lot less room for error, right? So if you, if you, if you screw up at any point this way, then it's, you, you can't really recover from it. You'll be more like a back checker. When you go on, if when in doubt, shoot. Why F2, F1? When in doubt, two on one, two on two, or whatever. If you don't know what to do, treat this like you're on a breakaway. So if I have the puck and the D is whatever, treat it like a breakaway. Just pretend everyone else is not there. You notice it, but they're not there. And you bust your ass to the net. If no one goes with you, you have a breakaway. If they do go with you, you have a free pass. So it's like little things. And then when in doubt, anytime you're in this area, Right, we call it, people call it the home plate, whatever you call it. Be ready to shoot, and you don't have to shoot to score. Shoot just to get rebounds, and if you do that, you're just going to increase your chances. The next part is if you we always talk about the play without the puck. When let's say some one someone on your team is is say you're this guy, right, the uh, guy without the puck. This guy's got the puck. Be aggressive. This is where you want to end up. You're going to get a ton of goals here. If you wait out in these areas for the nice pretty goals. Or the nice beauties, you're going to get a lot less goals. You're going to get a ton of goals if you're in that dirty area. That's all I got to say. Don't be afraid to shoot. But don't, you don't have to be afraid to shoot for pads, right? Shoot for the low pads a lot of the times. That way you get rebounds. And if this guy's crashing the net or you're crashing for your own rebound, you might get it. But it, the problem is a lot of guys try to go beauty shots, which is fine. It's great. But a lot of times if you become a beauty, the puck goes here. <laughs> goes all the way around and then you have to be a good neutral zone or defensive player <laughs> if you become a beauty I yeah love that. i say that all yeah. the time it's yeah. funny. No, so it's, it's like good. percentages rather than being a beauty so all this stuff is uh again just to reiterate none of these are the golden rule it's these are just some foundational things you can think about nothing is gospel you have to be able to make plays and make decisions and that's hopefully the takeaway but having a little bit of this basic knowledge basic structure whether you're a player or a coach um should be helpful so I think uh, next week, I just was thinking about this. Maybe we'll do uh, a little bit of a special teams one next week where we talk about power play, penalty kill, like some specific examples of each with like breakouts and stuff like that um, to touch on those two things because I think that would be the last the last two kind of pieces to sum up like yeah. basics. Maybe stuff. we will. So if, uh, maybe we'll I think do we should. Well. I think oh, we should. Maybe. Because I think, no, you know what? Because I was, It's got to be the basic basic though. Because, yeah, because I was thinking, just as an example, I was thinking about the power play with our guys and how they don't know off, or they need to work on, at least, off the breakout coming out together. Like, it doesn't matter what breakout you're doing. It's come out together. So it's like there's stuff through the, through the zone, into the offensive zone, into your setups um, on both sides, power play, penalty kill, that I think are, are worth talking about. So... Um, so we'll leave it at that for now and then uh, next week will be the last last one of this I believe so that's all goodbye